us an oncologist, I see cancer a lot, unfortunately. And in fact, I have seen a lot of lung cancer. And if you're not a cancer specialist, you might wonder what is cancer? How does it come about? And why is it so deadly? Well, there's still a lot we need to learn about cancer, but there are a few things we are beginning to understand better. One is that in general, especially for lung cancer, it begins as a precancerous process. What it is is that we all have cells in our body, billions of them, and our lungs are lined with cells called epithelial. And these things are there to help us, you know, feel better and survive the various problems that we might encounter. Uh, and so when you breathe in stuff that is irritating or aggravating to these cells, these cells try to make changes to survive the uh, hostile environment that they are being placed in. So the cells undergo to some genetic changes, basically just trying to survive the, the exposure they are being given. And along the way, some of these genetic mutations become something that makes the cell immortal. All of a sudden, the cells don't die anymore, they become immortal. And at the beginning, they are not multiplying yet, they just become bad cells. So they are precancerous, they haven't really formed a tumor yet. But if they survive long enough, they start growing, and then they form a tumor. Tumor means you have a big ball of you know, millions and billions of cells together, big enough that you can either see it on an x-ray or on a CAT scan or you can feel it, so that's what we call a tumor. And then at some point, if they get big enough, they start spreading. They, sp they get into the blood vessel, or they get into the lymphatics, they get to the lymph nodes, and from that point on, they can basically go anywhere in the body. So in general, that's a simplified concept about what cancer is and how it spreads and how it can be deadly. As you can imagine, once it gets into your blood, Sometimes it can make it into the brain, it can make it into the bones, it can make it to the liver. So lung cancer is a life-threatening disease, especially when it's spread. And obviously we all know that it can lead to death. What causes lung cancer? Well, a lot of studies have been done because this is such a deadly disease, such a common disease. So there are some things we know reasonably well. We know that smoking is a major, major cause of lung cancer. Maybe 87% of lung cancers are attributed to tobacco and tobacco products. Now, it doesn't have to be cigarettes. It can be smoking a pipe. It can be chewing tobacco. It can be any form of tobacco-related thing because tobacco has many things that can do this. So smoking is a number one cause of lung cancer. So if there's nothing that you remember at all when you leave here today, if you are among the 0.25%, you need to know that smoking is a major cause of lung cancer. Now, there are other things, genes. I'm sure everybody here knows someone who smoked a lot and never got cancer, right? I'm sure. I'm sure everybody here knows somebody who didn't smoke but still got lung cancer, right? So there are other factors involved, and your genes are important. Usually, we don't know what genes we have. We don't even have a good way of telling what genes predispose one to lung cancer. So the only glimpse we have of it is when there's a family history of lung cancer. So if your father had, uh, was a smoker and had lung cancer, your brother was a smoker and had lung cancer, there's a good chance that there's some genes in that family that predispose to lung cancer, and when you add cigarettes to it, boom, you get lung cancer. So your genes are important. When I first came to this country, oh, maybe 30 years ago now, um, there was a guy on TV, was it called George Burns? Anybody knows George Burns? Yeah, he used to smoke a cigar on TV all the time. I think that guy lived till like he was in the 90s, maybe 100. I bet he never got lung cancer. I bet he had good genes. But there were people I know in their 40s, actually the youngest lung cancer patient I've taken care of was 39 years old. He died before he was 40. So genes are a major factor. We don't know what genes we have. I don't know what genes I have, but cancer lives at the intersection of genes and exposure in the environment. And since I can't control my genes, I already got them, I can control my environment. So I try very hard to stay away from tobacco if I can. 
So genes are important, but I bet nobody here knows what genes they have, right? Okay, so if your family history of lung cancer, be careful. There are other environmental factors, asbestos exposure. Fortunately, that's becoming less than less. Back in the day, we didn't know it was dangerous, so pipe fitters and plumbers and electricians and maintenance workers, they got exposed to a lot of asbestos. And asbestos and smoking together is a deadly combination. The risk of lung cancer is up 40-fold. So if you've had asbestos exposure, you owe yourself a favor. No tobacco, because if you combine the two, it's real deadly. Um, there's radon gas exposure. We don't know enough about this. Radon is radioactive material that's in the soil and it's around our houses in certain places and so on. It's been real hard to study. It's really hard for me to know how much of that is a, a contribution to the lung cancers we have. And um, so everywhere you read, you'll probably run into that. It's not easy to you know, pick up. I guess if you're very neurotic about it, you can go get somebody to come and check the radon around your house and see if where you live is dangerous or not. Uh, but most of us feel that Smoking and genes and asbestos are the biggest problems. But if you are very worried, there are people who can come and check to see how much radon exposure your house is giving you. Uh, passive smoking, um, back in the day, uh, women had lung cancer that never smoked. And at that time, the, the thinking was that they must have gotten it from their husbands who smoked a lot, so they got passive smoking. Uh, some people got it from the job because back in the day, people smoked on the job, and whether you liked it or not, you inhaled this, the tobacco product. Uh, but we are finding more and more now that some of those passive smoking related cancers, probably not from that. There's a whole new field of lung cancers called EGFR mutation lung cancer. It usually happens in non smokers for whatever reason, it's more common in women and is particularly more common in people of oriental ancestry. So if you went to China, Hong Kong, there's a lot of that. Never smokers, usually women, and they get lung cancer. And so I think some of the passive smoking attributions that we've had in the past, maybe at least part of it is from that. Uh, some occupational exposures increase the risk of lung cancer. Uh, people who work in foundries, especially if you had exposure to nickel and cadmium, things like that, it can be a risk factor for lung cancer. I know we have to work, we have to make a living, and sometimes that's the job you have and do the best you can, but uh, certainly if there's an exposure, there should be increased sensitivity to being checked often so that if there's a problem, we can pick it up early. Now, how does lung cancer present? Um, if we wait long enough, the cancer is either in a good location or big enough, then you're gonna start having symptoms. I say that because someone can have a soccer ball sized tumor in their lung and not know it. You can have a big, if the location is right, you may not know you have a big tumor. But if it's near your airway, it might cause a cough, it might make you cough up blood, it might give you pain, it might make you hoarse, it might make you lose weight if it's big enough, it might take your appetite away, you may be short of breath, you might be feeling weak and tired, you might be having recurrent bronchitis and pneumonias, and um, you can just start wheezing even though you didn't used to uh, wheeze. Um, everyone who's a smoker probably knows that there's something called a smoker's cough. The cigarettes kind of irritate the airway, makes your lung makes a little extra mucus, and you kind of have to cough and clay it up a little bit. And they know how it is, and it doesn't bother them because they're used to it. Well, if they get lung cancer, that smoker's cough may change character. The cough either becomes worse or becomes more severe or more frequent or something. So when there's a change in character of that smoker's cough, be careful, it could be cancer. Now, what's not on this list is that the lung cancer can be picked up um, incidentally. And that's usually a good sign. People will be in an accident, they get x-rays done, checking for fractures, and boom, they find a mass on the x-ray. Or people having a CAT scan for something else, and they find a nodule, and that can lead to diagnosis of cancer. So there's a lot of incidental uh, discovery of lung cancer, which frequently tend to be not as advanced as people who are symptomatic before we find it. Uh, I have a good friend of mine whose wife went to the hospital to get 
a chest x-ray because you had to get a, a TB test. Everybody has had TB test before, I bet. Yeah. So um, I'm from Ghana, and back in the day, everyone in Ghana had to have a TB vaccination. We call that BCG. And once you have a BCG vaccination, every time they do that PPD test, you test positive. Well, in the United States, every time you test positive, they have to send a chest x-ray to make sure you don't have active TB. So my friend's wife had his chest x-ray, which he's had every year. She's a director of a library, and nobody wants her to be giving TB to people. So they sent her for an x-ray. Well, this time the x-ray showed a mass. It turns out she had lung cancer. She had never smoked. She had that EGFR mutation lung cancer. She had surgery. She's doing well now. So a lot of incidental lung cancers are found, and frequently they tend to be earlier stage. So it can sometimes be a blessing. Now, this is to explain how your lungs work. I'm sure everybody knows how their lungs work. You, you, your lungs expand, your diaphragm moves down, it decreases the pressure in your lung, and air rushes in through your nose, through your mouth. It gets through the main airway, which you call the trachea, goes through here. Your trachea is the main windpipe, and then it divides, one goes to the right lung, one goes to the left, we call the right mainstem bronchus, then the left form we call the left mainstem bronchus. Well, then these start dividing into more branches until they get small enough that they have what we call alveoli. They are little grapes, they are little pockets of balloons. The, these, those, those are the business end of your lung. That's where exchanges of oxygen and carbon dioxide really occur. So those little grapes you see there, those are what we call the alveoli. That's the business end of the lung. Everything else is just a conduit trying to deliver air to those pockets where the exchange really takes place. That's how your lungs work. When the air gets in there, then by elastic recoil, everything collapses a little bit and the, lung co the air comes back out. And then you start again. So you have inspiration and then expiration. And during that process, you are getting oxygen to your blood and washing out the carbon dioxide out. So as you can imagine, if somebody is breathing in toxic agents like tobacco smoke, number one, when the air is going down those tubes, it starts irritating the cell. They're not used to that. They don't want that. So then they start making mucus, trying to trap them. They start making you cough so they can get rid of these things that they don't like. And sometimes they get damaged, and then you get chronic bronchitis. And people with chronic bronchitis, they cough a lot, especially in the morning. They cough gobs and gobs and gobs of mucus because the lung is still trying to get rid of what they think is something dangerous. And long, if, you, if the process goes long enough, those balloons over there, those alveoli, they start getting damaged, they get destroyed, they get scar tissue, and you get emphysema. And once you get chronic damage to the lung, it cannot be reversed. So your best chance is not to get them, because once we get them, we can't fix it. Maybe unless you get a lung transplant. Now, I made a few comments already about what smoking can do to your lungs. It certainly does other things. Um, it can trigger asthmatic attacks in people who are susceptible, so they start wheezing more or get more short of breath. And as I said, it can irritate the lung and, and give you a uh, smoker's cough and give you emphysema. As I mentioned before, tobacco is the leading cause of lung cancer. 87% is attributed to tobacco. Um, the risk of getting lung cancer, as I said, depends on your genes, number one. When you start smoking, the longer the duration of the exposure, the higher is the risk. The amount you smoke, so two pack a day smoker is at a bigger risk than one pack a day smoker or half a pack a day smoker. Your gender matters. Women are at a higher risk for the same amount of cigarettes. In other words, a woman's lung is much smaller than a man's lung. So if they're all putting one pack of cigarettes a day, you know the woman's lung is getting higher concentration, right? Because you've got a smaller lung, you're putting one pack a day, so there's a lot more exposure. So women don't have to smoke as much as men to get the same lung cancer risk. I've got product smoke, but uh, I'm sure everyone knows about uh, filterless tobacco and caramels and all this stuff because 
Everything just goes straight in there, not just the nicotine, but the tar, everything goes into the lungs. So the kind of tobacco you smoke, I mean, the kind of uh, product you use matters. Uh, some people say they're able to smoke, but not inhale. I know a famous president who said he didn't inhale. Uh, but I think the whole idea of smoking is to get the nicotine into your lungs so it can get to your blood, so you can feel good with it. So I don't know how you can get that pleasure without inhaling and getting it deep down there. But people say they don't inhale. Um, but, and as I said, the, your genetic makeup matters. Now, this year alone, we estimate that there'll be 224,000 people diagnosed with lung cancer in the United States. 224,000. That's a bit much. And that's why lung cancer is a big deal. 160,000 people will be dead from lung cancer this year. That's a lot, especially for a disease that we have the opportunity to prevent. That's a lot of deaths. So it is a big deal. Now, what you see on the left-hand side is the death from pancreas cancer, from colon cancer, and from breast cancer. If we put it all together, all those together, all the breast cancer deaths, I bet you all hear a lot more about breast cancer on TV and the radio and people talking than you hear about lung cancer. But breast cancer doesn't even cause even a third of the cancer, of the cancer deaths from lung cancer. Lung cancer alone kills more people from pancreas, than pancreas, breast, colon, and prostate put together. It's a big deal. Now, one of the reasons I'm here, why we are talking about this is that the death rate from lung cancer is bad. Only 15% of people diagnosed, all comers, 15% of all lung cancer diagnosed will be alive five years later. 85% will be dead. Not necessarily in the first month, but certainly in less than five years. 15% survives, so it's a big deal. Now compare that with prostate cancer, 99% will still be alive at five years. Breast cancer, 88% all comers, 88% are still alive. And colon cancer, 64% will still be alive at five years. Compare that with lung cancer, 15%. So we got a problem, right? It's a big problem. Now, one of the reasons for that is that in general, lung cancer tends to be diagnosed late. Look at that, only 15% of patients with lung cancer will be diagnosed when the cancer is confined to the lung, where it's not in the lymph nodes, where it hasn't spread anywhere. 15%. Everybody else is already past that. It's more advanced. 22% of them, the cancer is already in the lymph nodes. And look at that, more than half of the patients had diagnosis that cancer is already spread, distant, stage four disease. In general, stage four disease is not curable. So it's one of the reasons why we don't make enough progress with lung cancer, because people are usually diagnosed late. Now, the diagnosis stage alone is not the explanation for the horrible thing. There are other factors. Lung cancer behave differently from prostate cancer or breast cancer. And also, our treatments may not be nearly as effective as they are for breast cancer and some of the other cancers. So there are many factors, uh, and lung cancer may have a tendency to spread early, so that even when patients are diagnosed at stage one, where it's just confined, maybe a coin size lesion in the lung, many times cells have already escaped into the bone marrow in other places. So that even if you go and cut it out, that cancer is coming back and kill some of the patients. So early diagnosis is important. Uh, it can reduce the risk of death, but it certainly doesn't eliminate it because sometimes the cancer is already spread, even when it's small. Even when the cancer is confined to just the lung and the lymph node, we call that stage two or stage three lung cancer. The survival is still not very good. Five year survival is only 54%. So even though it hasn't spread, about half of the people will be dead in, 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 uh, in less than five years. Now, I want to compare lung cancer with the other cancers you know about. Look at prostate cancer. In the 70s, 68% of people will be alive at five years. In the 2000s, it's improved to 99%, so we made a lot of progress, right? Colon cancer used to be 50% survival. Now it's 64%, so we made progress. Not as much as prostate. Breast cancer used to be 75% in the 70s. 
Now it's 89%. Made good progress. Look at lung cancer. In the 70s, survival was 12%. In the 2000s, survival is 16%. Not a lot of progress. Now, one of the differences is that all those other three cancers have a screening test. We have a screening PSA, digital rectal exam, so we can pick up prostate cancer a little early. Years ago, men didn't show up with prostate cancer until they were having back pain or doing an x-ray and they had prostate cancer already spread. Now with PSA, we are diagnosing prostate cancer rather early. Sometimes earlier than we need to, but we probably having overdiagnosis now because we've got a blood test. Colon cancer, we got colonoscopy. Colon cancer deaths have been rapidly declining because we keep plugging out all those polyps before they get a chance to become cancer. Breast cancer, we got mammograms. We can pick up breast cancer early. Lung cancer, it's only now that we begin to think about screening. I'm going to say a, little, a word or two about lung cancer screening, but some of the difference is because those things have screening tests and lung cancer didn't have one. Now, that's what has changed. There was a, a large study, uh, a national lung cancer screening trial, because we've always uh, wanted to find a way to diagnose lung cancer early. Since we can't cure it when it's advanced, and traditionally we've been finding it when it's too late, maybe if we can screen people, find it early, we have a better chance of making people live longer. Um, there were multiple attempts made in the past where they used chest x-rays, it didn't work very well. Um, either they, they didn't find it early enough or it didn't make a difference because by the time they found it, it was large and it, it didn't make an impact on the viral survival. Well, CT scans seem to have changed that. They got 53,000 people to participate. They used low dose. That's important because radiation, if you get enough exposure to radiation, you can develop cancer of some kind. Although the risk is relatively low, but when they use low dose CT scans, the radiation exposure is small, and that's important, that they don't use contrast, so the, the exposure is less. They use low dose CT scans, low dose radiation CT scans, and when they compared that with chest x-rays, they had 20% fewer lung cancer deaths. So low dose CT screening can reduce death rate for lung cancer by 20%. If you're going to do a screening test that involves CT scans and so on, you, you want to be able to do it in people who have a high risk of getting cancer so that you can impact on their, on their survival uh, better. So in the trial, you have to be between 55 and 74. You must either be a current smoker or a former smoker with at least a 30-pack year smoking history. In other words, if you smoke a pack a day, if you smoke for 30 years, then you qualify. If you smoke two packs a day, you only need to smoke for 15 years to qualify. So that's what the 30-pack year history is about. Um, active smokers were all strongly urged to enter a smoking cessation program. I mean, if you are interested in doing scans to pick up cancer early to cure it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to keep smoking, right? So if you're going to do it, then you really should also quit smoking. Uh, former smokers. You must, quit, um, you must have quit smoking in the last 15 years to qualify, and you must have reasonably general good health. Somebody has terrible other medical problems and the survival is not expected to be better than a year or two, they won't benefit from this kind of screening, so you must have relative good health to participate in the trial. As I said, the benefit of the study was that it did reduce the risk of dying from lung cancer. It certainly doesn't protect you from other cancers, but it does help about lung cancer. The, the, the test is a, a screening CT, no IV contrast is given, so you're not going to have a re reaction to the contrast. Again, it's a low dose radiation exposure, so the risk of having trouble, like risk of cancer from the radiation is very low. It takes less than 10 minutes to do the test. It's easy to schedule. There's an 800 number that you could call, and, just, and they give you free and accessible parking if, if you do it at ATMC. Low dose CT scans will not find all lung cancers, certainly will not find all cancers. They only screen the lungs, so if someone had colon cancer, please don't expect that it's going to pick that up. Or somebody had a brain tumor, you know? so it's a screening for lung cancer, and sometimes you can have cancer that doesn't form 
a mass enough for the CT to pick it up. So it, it's not 100%, but it certainly makes a big difference. Uh, not all patients who have lung cancer will be diagnosed with this to avoid lung cancer. Even if you find cancer with a screening test, I should say lung cancer is a bad one. So even if we find it early, sometimes people can still die from it. So you need to understand that before. Everything we're doing to reduce the risk is not to eliminate the risk of dying from lung cancer. There is some risk or harm to being screened, just like prostate cancer. I'm sure you all sometimes, or even breast cancer mammogram. There's stuff on TV and radio all the time about the potential harm of being screened. Well, that's true for lung cancer screening too. Because sometimes we might find a nodule in the lung. We are not sure if it's a benign nodule or if it's cancerous. So if we find calcium deposits in it, it makes us feel confident that it's benign, that it's not cancer. But if there's no calcium deposits in that nodule, then it could be a cancer. So at that point, we might have to do more testing. We might do a PET scan to look at it better. We may even have to do a biopsy to see if it's cancer or not. And so because there are adverse effects of these things, sometimes it's an extra risk to you if you get screened. So that you have to understand there's some potential downside to being screened. Again, there's a low dose radiation. Uh, if you did it a lot of times, I guess there's a potential of some kind of uh, potential harm, but it's very low. Um, certainly, we want everybody who is participating to quit smoking, and that screening is not an alternative to stopping smoking. Now, I have a couple of comments on smoking. The CDC estimates that 18% of us 12 years and older are smokers. 20% for men, 16% of women. Now, for many years, the smoking rate was declining in the U.S., especially in men. Uh, after several decades, it seems as if the smoking rate has plateaued. In other words, despite all the widespread knowledge about the risk of smoking, people still find a reason to smoke, and we are not getting the continuing decline that we would want. And certainly, the last time I looked, the smoking in women has not quite turned the corner yet. It was still going up. National surveys show that 70% of smokers say they want to quit. At least they say they want to quit. I don't know if they really want to quit, but they sometimes say they want to quit. 50% have actually tried in a, within the preceding year of the, of the survey. So at least there's interest. Now, 95% of those who try to quit on their own, they relapse. Usually within the first week, they're back to smoking. It's hard. It's hard to quit smoking. So it's better not to start because once you get in there, it's, it's not easy. Um, I'm sure all of you know somebody who has strong you know, willpower and she just one day decided, I'm not going to smoke anymore, and I put it down, and they never smoked again. Not too many of these people exist. It's hard to quit smoking. 95% will relapse. So, and some of, that, some of the reason for that is that, let me see if I have a slide on there. So one of the reasons for that is that uh, smoking is an addiction. Just like all addictions, your brain does all kinds of adaptations to make it important for you to continue to smoke. Just like cocaine, like, like you know, smoking weed or marijuana and so on. It's an addiction. These things take over, they usurp and take over your pleasure reward system. So that the only thing that gives you pleasure is that thing, is that cigarette, that nicotine. And if you don't have it, you ain't gonna feel good. You're gonna feel bad and you, you're going to feel like you're depressed, you can't do anything, your mind can't work right, because the entire pleasure reward system has been taken over. Everything is depending on that system to work, otherwise you can't. And it's very hard to overcome that. Some of the addiction experts say that some of the reason for that is that um, normally we, our frontal lobe, the part of the brain which is our intelligence center, has some inhibition effect on the things that we do by impulse. So if you have a well-developed and strong frontal lobe, when you try to get a cigarette, they might say, hey, don't do that. Don't pick it up. Don't pick it. It's not good for you. Don't take it. 
the reason why young people, teenagers, are the worst of this problem is that their frontal lobes are not very well developed. <laughs> you have to be, get over 20 to have strong inhibition from the common sense part of what we all do every day. So they tend to be more impulsive because they don't have that inhibition. So somebody offered them a cigarette, sure, they try it. And if they like it, soon enough, the system, the pleasure reward system is taken over and they're done. It's hard to get off. It's very, very, very difficult. If you have a way of keeping your teenage son or, or daughter from trying cigarettes, I know it's hard. We all don't control the friends they have. Somehow they always find a way to get the right friend who introduces them to these things. Addiction rate is high if they start smoking before age 20. So if you can get past 25, the, even when they pick up smoking after that, the addiction rate is a lot less. So smoking is very difficult to overcome because there are very powerful brain adaptations that go on when you get addicted to something. And it's not easy to overcome. There's a battle between, you know it's not good for you, but, you need, but you're gonna do it anyway. It's, it's tough. In one survey, 23% of, of patients who have survived cancer, smoking-related cancer, still smoking at the end of one year. I would think that if I smoke and I get cancer, that should scare me enough that I shouldn't touch a cigarette. More than 20% are still smoking. And there's a reason for that. They're addicted. It's hard to get off it. They, they find a way to rationalize it. They're in denial. They don't believe this smoking caused their cancer. There's all kinds of reasons why they still feel they got to smoke. Somebody said, the Nile is not just a river in Egypt. It's everywhere. <laughs> There's a lot of denial in smokers, plenty of it. So the two words you need to remember, don't smoke. Now, obviously, um, it's like preaching to the choir here. I'm sure you all know you shouldn't smoke, right? You all know that. Now, there is some help for smokers. You won't get anywhere unless you are motivated to quit. If the person is not willing or ready to quit, all the things we have don't work very well. Even when they are ready, there's success, but it's not like huge success. So we have some help, there's some non-pharmacologic aids, there's hypnosis where people can kind of talk you into overcoming those impulses from that pleasure reward center to enhance your inhibition so that you can overcome that urge. Um, and they have, the psychiatrists have a way of doing what they call cognitive behavioral therapy. Kind of helps you to overcome the urge, make you feel the difference between what you really, what is important for you and how this smoking is going to make that impossible to achieve. All kinds of tricks they have. So it does help some. Um, we have medicines. Clearly, we have nicotine replacement. Most of the addiction is to nicotine. It's not to the tar. The cancer comes largely from the tar, which has all these carcinogens in it. So when you replace smoking with nicotine, at least you are overcoming the effect from the tar. You might still have addiction to the nicotine, but at least you're not going to get a tar. So we have it as a spray. We have a patch. We have a gum. We'll try and replace it everywhere we can if you are willing to do it. There's all kinds of products on the market. Most of these are over the counter. Uh, there's bupropion, which is really an antidepressant. Uh, otherwise called Wellbutrin, but when we're giving it for smoking sensation, it's got to be Zyban, but it's the same drug. Um, there's Chantix or Varenicline. Uh, it's supposed to take away your urge. It's a partial agonist. It does affect the nicotine receptor some. Um, I know that there are some side effects to some of these drugs, um, but everything has side effects. If smoking has, I mean, if something has side effects, it's smoking. So I find that people are not very motivated. They focus a lot on the side effects of the drugs. They're finding reasons why they shouldn't get off the smoking because the drugs are too dangerous. They cause vivid dreams sometimes. Some patients say they get irritable. Some actually have occasional suicidal thoughts. So there are some side effects to the drug, but I mean, if you're doing this in conjunction with the doctor, you can be monitored, the dose can be adjusted, and it does help. Uh, as far as I know, um, Chantix is the most effective drug we have right now. There are many others that are being tried, or experimental things. There's the Pyramid or Topomax, 
clonidine is a blood pressure medicine, nortriptyline is an antidepressant, dianiclin is a cousin of Chantix, cytosine, and even vaccines are being tried. So people are really trying. But as you say, the best way to avoid, uh, to avoid the trouble is not to smoke. There are barriers. People feel like the damage is already done, so they don't need to give up their pleasure. <laughs> Some will say, it's the only pleasure I have. I don't run around with wild women. I don't, <laughs> I don't drink. This is the only pleasure, so I got to have something. <laughs> Some say, I enjoy smoking, and I'd rather die happy, so they keep smoking. Lots of excuses. Some say the drugs that we have available cause too many side effects. Some can afford the patches, but they can afford the cigarettes, but not the patches. And of course, there are people who swear that smoking is not the cause of any cancer. So there's a lot of barriers, and um, I want to remind you at the end of it all that lung cancer is a very deadly form of cancer, but it's one of the most preventable cancers. Hopefully I've had a chance to share with you how important it is not to smoke, and if you smoke, to quit, but above all, to help our children, our brothers, our daughters, not to get into the habit, our grandchildren, watch their friends, because usually somebody gets introduced to these things by a friend.